Good afternoon. Okay, welcome to the second of many lectures for Chem1A. The last time we had fun with explosions, but they all made some sense. In so far that we reacted hydrogen and oxygen to form water. And we have seen two things. First of all, it makes a big bang and releases energy. That means that the reactants, the hydrogen and the oxygen, was in a certain energy state. And then they went together and formed a bond to make water, H2O, and they released energy. And when they release energy, they themselves must be in a low energy state. And this is depicted here. This is our reaction coordinate. And that means it's our development in time, essentially. And this is the energy here. It goes from less to more, from lower to higher. And our reactants were here about at this energy level. And our products were at this energy level. So the difference, if I extrapolate this over here, that difference here is the energy that was released. So the first message you can take home is there were bonds formed. Hydrogen and oxygen form bonds to form water. And when bonds are formed, energy is always released. Engrave this in your brain. Energy is released when bonds are formed. You need energy to break bonds. Anybody else who tells you the opposite is wrong. And nevertheless, there will be always some people at the, at the end, even at the final, they think in order to make bonds, you need to put in energy, which is not true. Okay? So when bonds are formed, energy is released. So we have seen that we needed a certain ratio of hydrogen to oxygen to make water. And that ratio was, in fact, two uh, molecules of hydrogen, H2, and one molecule of oxygen makes two molecules of water. The water evaporated. That's why I didn't see it. It didn't rain. Okay? Uh, but it evaporated. So we had about a mole of hydrogen in the balloon at the beginning. Then we put a half a mole of oxygen and half a mole of hydrogen in the balloon. That was a much more vivid and much faster explosion. But it was still not the right ratio. Then we put one third of a mole of oxygen and two thirds of a mole of hydrogen in the balloon. And the balloon always had the same size. You just can gradually fill it with this stuff because equal volumes of different gases have the same number of atoms. And I've showed you the cube, the 22.4 liter. That's about the size of a, this balloon. This is about a mole of gas. Okay? So we had two moles of hydrogen uh, molecules plus one mole of oxygen molecules form two moles of water molecules. And remember, I put the flame to it. and the flame was mainly there to penetrate that balloon. But we also needed a tiny little bit of energy to get the reaction started, to get a couple of hydrogen and oxygen uh, molecules over that hump that's called the activation energy. And then think of it on a one-to-one -one molecular scale. They react with each other, and they release a little bit of energy. And that energy is picked up by the other molecules, oxygen and hydrogen, and they react with each other. And this is then a chain reaction. So I would need a very tiny flame for this. And I gave you this example when somebody flips the light switch in a room that's filled with oxygen and hydrogen. We all go boom, OK, and something more. So <clears throat> now we had then talked about how we weigh this. With gases, it was easy, but how we can weigh this. I need the right amount of this substance and the right amount of these molecules or, or atoms. How do I weigh that? So we knew, and this is uh, as wise people have determined this, that 12 grams of carbon-12 have exactly a very, very large number of atoms, of carbon atoms. They have exactly one mole. One mole, remember our secret language? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms are in one mole. And now, if I have something which is twice as heavy than carbon, then one mole would weigh not 12 gram, but it would weigh 24 gram. Okay? And so this is what you see here in the periodic table. Here, these are the molar masses. That's what one mole, for example, one mole of oxygen is 16 grams. Okay? This is the molar mass, grams per mole. And so this is how we now we have this relative to each other. Now you can weigh this stuff, and you can do, do your reactions. And then at the end, I showed you how to lower that barrier. And this was not quite clear to some of you. We had a nozzle where there was hydrogen coming off, and then we had a piece of platinum. And Karen, she warmed this up a little bit. It was not glowing, the piece of platinum, just to get the reaction started. And she held the piece of platinum in front of the hydrogen nozzle, and what it did, it started to glow. Okay? And why did it glow? Because we made water, and the water reaction gave off energy when the water was formed, and it heated up that piece of platinum. It needs a lot of energy to heat up a piece of platinum. So this was a catalyst. This is how you lower the activation energy. This is how catalysts work, work. And this is as much as you will hear about kinetics uh, in this lecture from me at all. We do thermodynamics. We deal with differences in energy. And this is a, a whole load to deal with, actually. So I have this reaction here. I wrote this reaction for you. Hydrogen and oxygen react to water. Now I have one mole of hydrogen and two moles of oxygen. And I want to know which species has the greatest number of moles after the reaction is finished. So you're making water. And you might have something left over. Maybe you have hydrogen left over, or oxygen left over, or you have nothing left over, and this would be the largest number of species left. So think about this and give me your answer. So we did this already the last time, but some of you would like to think again about this. There it is, OK. So all you need to do, use this equation here. No talking. Don't cheat yourself, OK? You can talk as much as you like, really, but uh, it's not a good idea. Talk afterwards. Second time, you really can talk. To discuss this, you convince your neighbor that you are right, and he or she is wrong, or vice versa, actually. Or you both are right, and both are wrong, actually, at the end. <laughs> uh, the bookstore says one bookstore, which we'll have later today, 50 or 100 extra books. And on Monday, the other bookstore, I can name names, will have another 100 books. And so what I will do, I will keep the homework open for another week, OK? And we start iClicker counting on Wednesday, not on Monday. Then everybody has the iClicker, everybody has the book. I'm for you, I'm on your side, OK? <laughs> it's not about tricking, it's about learning for you, OK? <laughs> Wait with the clapping. Wait a couple of lectures. You probably not clap anymore. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's this niche guy. We hate him. <laughs> I appreciate it, though. Thank you. OK, let's see what we, what we have here. Very good. That would be pretty sad if you wouldn't get that. But nevertheless, I had a discussion. I had a discussion this morning, and they had this distribution. And I posted the question again. I said, it's not always the majority. I just said it. The, the word was always. So they totally got it wrong. <laughs> they, they totally sort of, uh, I don't want to use the word. They, they made a mistake. <laughs> OK, so let's see for those couple of people who accidentally pushed the wrong button. Uh, Let's see, you have one mole of hydrogen and two moles of oxygen. But you need twice as much hydrogen than oxygen. Okay? So if you have one mole and two moles of oxygen, so let's divide this, then you have one mole here, one mole of hydrogen, half a mole of oxygen. That's what you need. So how many moles of oxygen you have left over? One and a half. And how many moles of water do you make if you divide this by two? One mole. So the answer that one that you have the most left over, uh -huh, we have even a pictorial form here, and this is what we took off. Now, hydrogen was the limiting reagent. It limited the reaction. The reaction did not 
go further because we didn't have enough right hydrogen. So that's called limiting reagents. And so this is what I just told you, and this was the answer. Just fantastic. Okay, today we're going to find out how we get these ratios. But first, we talk a little bit about the atom and uh, itself. So there was this fellow, Rutherford. He lived in the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, and he was a physicist, and this was the time when they discovered how the nucleus is, how the atoms are made, there are electrons and nucleons and so on. And so at this 1919, they didn't really know that there was a nucleus. They sort of suspected it. They knew a little bit about electrons, and they made this one experiment. They had discovered radioactivity. Marie Curie and Becquerel and uh, Pierre Curie discovered radioactivity. And uh, they, in the, in the end of the century, and so they are radioactive elements. And radioactivity means they spit out some particles from the nucleus. Okay, the nucleus is not stable. It wants to become stable. They have to get rid of some particles. That's what radioactivity is, instability of the nucleus. And so one possibility is they spit out, or they emit from the nucleus, this be more, more uh, honed, uh, they spit out helium, helium nuclei. Helium is element number what? Two. And this is how many, uh, this is the number of what? Two is the number of protons. And it's helium four. There's a four out there. What would that be? The number of nucleons. How many neutrons and protons you have? I get to this in a minute. So it has two neutrons and two protons. Okay. So this is why helium has the atomic, number four, uh, atomic mass 4.00. See that? Four. And so he had this compound and it spit out this helium. It radioactively decayed, to be precise or accurate. It radioactively decayed and emitted alpha particles. And these are helium, charged helium particles. And then he had a piece of gold foil. You probably have seen this gold foil, which is so thin that you can look through. And they use it to gild, to put gold layers in churches and so on and so on. Uh, for rings, it's too thin. Okay. <coughs> so that means now you have these positively charged helium particles. And you have that, that uh, gold foil. He put it in a frame. And around it, he had a ring where he could sort of make scintillations. That means when he, these alpha particles stri uh, strike it, they give off the energy and it's a light flash. Okay. So this is a, a luminescent screen there. You can see where the particles hit it. Where there's a light flash, the particle gets hit. And so as you could expect, it's pretty thin, that gold. And so the alpha particles, they flew right through there. Okay. And so they made light flashes here, here, and here. Some got a little scattered. But then he's seen some of them came right back at him. They went to the front, and here, and here, and here. So that could only happen if there was a deflection due to charge of the, the gold foil. So you have the helium particles. Did I say they are positively charged? So if they get deflected, anybody heard about Coulomb's interaction? Nobody? Okay. Coulomb interaction, you have equal charges, they repulse each other. Okay. Opposite charges, they attract each other. So he's seen repulsion here, and he says, you know, this is so thin, this must be, we know that the electrons are negative, that must be the nuclei, they must be positively charged. And how right he was. See, that's all the protons, they are positively charged. With this, he assessed that you have a positive charge in the nucleus. Okay. So and you also have a neutral charge in the nucleus. These are the neutrons. The protons, the positive ones, and the neutrons, the negative ones. So I just told you about this Coulomb repulsion, but you have in this nucleus, you have these positive charges. So the nucleus shouldn't be stable, shouldn't it? Because they should always fall apart. Any nucleus should fall apart. Why, why is it that the nucleus doesn't fall apart? Any of the in physics, anybody? Who can tell me about it? Yeah, say it loud. Uh -huh. There are four elementary forces, and one of them is the strong force. So when they, these nucleons, these are the, the protons, come very close to each other, then the Coulomb interaction does not work anymore. The strong force is holding them together. And they are held together by what? Anybody? By gluons, from the word glue. Okay, these gluons actually are the carriers of the strong force. So that's how they help together. That's enough about the nucleus so far. So <clears throat> we also know that this nucleus has this, po this positive charge and it has a neutral, neutral uh, particles. So these are nucleons, we call this a proton, and a neutron, is, each of them is a nucleon, you can add them up. So you have the positive charge, and this is the atomic number. That's also the atomic symbol. It's each atomic symbol refers to a specific number. And this is why you have the periodic table. So how many protons has carbon? Six, excellent. And uh, radon? 86, okay. And so how many electrons does it have to have? Because it has to be charge neutral. So you can't have, at, at atoms, they have no charge. So you have to have an equal number of electrons somewhere out there that neutralize the charge. So it looks to the outside as neutral. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you have, that's what I just told you, that you have the negative charge and the positive charge, negative charge is the electron, the positive charge is the nucleon. And so the number of electrons equal the number of the protons. And so what is the atomic mass? Is the atomic mass is the mass of the pro of protons? What else? The mass of the neutrons. And this makes most of the mass of any atom. Most of the mass sits in this tiny, tiny little nucle uh, nucleus. How tiny is that nucleus? Actually, it's very tiny. Anybody remember I talked about an atom, atom radius the last time? And he has a number still, it's a, a billionth of a meter or something like this, 10 to minus 9 it was, wasn't it? This was 0.1 times 10 to minus 9, so it was a tenth of a billionth of a meter. So that was 0.1 nanometer. Nanometer is minus 9, 0.1 is a tenth of a nanometer, so this is 10 to minus 10 meters. That's the radius of an average atom. And so, but the nucleus itself, the average radius of a nucleus is about 10 to minus 15 meters. There's five orders of magnitude difference. So these electrons out there, they're somewhere out there, far away. So the, most of these, you have the mass, then you have the electrons, and that atom, there's nothing in between, or very little in between these, the electrons and the nucleus. So let's assume that I have a quarter here, and we say that quarter is a centimeter, okay, or a little bit larger than a centimeter. So that quarter would be a centimeter, so I would have five orders of magnitude smaller, uh, five orders of magnitude away, this is a centimeter, would be the electrons, is that right? Because that's the radius of the atom, the average radius. So five orders, that's a centimeter, 100 centimeters is a meter, that's 10 to the fifth, 10 to the third, so it's about a thousand meters. And since this is not one centimeter, it's closer to one and a half or two centimeters, so you know where the first electrons would be? At the Berkeley BART station. Okay, this gives you the relation of size between the nucleus and the electrons. And the electrons, many of you learned in school, uh, or some of you learned in school, in high school, that there's this Bohr model where they go in these circles around it. That's total months to forget this all, okay? Uh, this was 100, 100, and, uh, 100 years ago. That was a good model. But we have quantum mechanics. We actually have no idea where these electrons are. We can calculate the probability that they are there, but not there, okay? And this is called orbital. And this is what we're going to do. So we really, nobody ever has seen an electron. And we will calculate the probability, not we, I will show you some pictorial uh, uh, diagrams, which shows you the probability where these electrons can be around the nucleus. All right, so let's go on to this here. Make sure that I have my money back. And not strangle myself. 
Uh, so A is the number of nucleons, which is essentially the atomic mass. It's not quite, because the nucleons have each of them a mass around one, okay? And, but the, the nucleon number is a whole number, but the atomic mass is not a whole number. And this comes, so the nucleon number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. That's the nucleon number, it's not the mass, essentially. So, and now you see the proton has 10 to minus 27 kilo. One proton with 10 to minus 27 kilo. That's why we define this AMU, that we don't have this 10 to minus 7 kilo. We say it's an AMU. You multiply this, with the, uh, you divide this by the AMU, then you get 1.0728 uh, AMU, okay? So which one is heavier, the neutron or the proton? The neutron is heavier. The, the proton has a charge of one, the neutron has a, no charge, and the electron, see how much lighter this is? The electron, it's how many? It's 10 to the 30, so it's about uh, three orders of magnitude, one two thousandth about of magnitude lighter than the proton and the neutron. Nevertheless, if you calculate the mass, very exact, you need to incorporate or include the electrons, even if they are very light. So because you, if you have a lot of them, then it makes a difference. Not a whole lot of difference in terms of mass, but to be uh, precise, we need to think about this. So now the protons are made out of what? Protons are made out of what? Quarks, okay? There actually are six quarks, but I only talk about two. These are the ones which are interesting for us. They have charge. Ah, and the protons and quarks, they held together by these gluons. That's strong force, okay? Uh, the, 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 the. And so you have here, you have an up quark that this has a charge of plus two thirds times the elementary charge. There's an elementary charge. And a down quark of minus one third times the elementary charge. So how many up and down quarks do I need to make a charge of one? How many quarks do I need and which kind of quarks? So I need two of those, that's four thirds. Two thirds plus two thirds is four thirds. And then I need one of those, minus one third, that's three thirds, that's a charge of one. Okay, so I need an up, up, down quark. Now how many, how many do I need to make a neutron? Come on, somebody. Yeah, okay, two down, one up. Okay, there you go, up, up, down, up, down, down. That's a charge of zero, okay? All right, so we have done this, and now you heard about isotopes. Isotopes are the same kind of element, but they have the same number of protons, which de determines that's a specific element. So if you have six protons, it's always carbon. But you can have different number of neutrons. If you have six neutrons, it's carbon-12. Seven neutrons, carbon-13. Eight neutrons, carbon-14. And you can do the same with oxygen. Oxygen, as you breathe it, has oxygen-16 and oxygen-18. So oxygen is what element? Eight. How many protons does oxygen have? Eight. So oxygen-16 has how many neutrons? And oxygen-18? Ten, exactly. So which one is heavier? Eighteen, okay? So now I make water. So this oxygen... 16 and 18 is a natural ratio that exists here in our oxygen. So I make water. So I can make water H2O16 and H2O18. H2O16 has what mass? 18 grams per mole. And H2O18 has what mass? 20 grams per mole. So water which has oxygen 18 is heavier. So now if you have this, you can use this as a temperature probe that ratio. Now if you have a certain temperature and the temperature rises, more of the oxygen 18 will, comp will evaporate compared to when it's colder. And so we know that ratio of oxygen 16 and 18. And we can then somehow recalculate from that change in ratio what the temperature was. This is what climatology does. How could you do that? Where would you get these samples of water with oxygen 16 and oxygen 18? Where would you get that? In the ice. So far, it snows in Greenland, in the Arctic, in the Antarctica. It snows there. And this gives you a, a record for each year, or at that time when it snowed, it gives you a record what the ratio of H2O16 to H2O18 was, and many other isotopic ratios, of course. So what you do, you drill down there, 3,000 meters, okay, once we quarter miles, or, and deeper, and you pull this out as an ice core, and this looks like an ice core. This is an ice core. They have Thousands, hundreds and thousands of meters of those, so they, cut, they drill this out, and of course they can't mix it up, they have to stack it properly, that they know where the beginning and where the end is, and then they chop this up in segments, okay? And this ice core, it, it snows, the snow stays there, and then next season, snows again, snows again, snows again, snows again, so you get very many, many years back you can uh, date this. So, and of course if you have enough snow on it, then it becomes ice due to the pressure. And there's also, is uh, gases are trapped in there, CO2 for example, and other gases. So you, if you carefully do that, then you can also analyze for gases to get isotopic ratio. But I just give you the gist of the principle of this, that's how you can date things backwards, and you see that obviously, this is the Greenland uh, ice core, it was 1800 meters, 1.2 uh, miles about deep, and you see the differences here, of course there's light shown on it, the differences between each year. So this is what you get. You get, we go back 300,000 years, you see this is this, the temperature, this is what they correlate from these data, and this is the temperature, uh-huh, this is obviously the temperature in Antarctica, in Fahrenheit, so these are the changes in temperature, there are uh, changes over 20, 20, uh, two degrees, so, uh-huh, this must have been a very hot area at the time, and then we got very cold again, that's one ice age, and the next one warmer again, and the ice age again, and now we're here, we're coming towards our time, so we're coming off an ice age here, and now we are going, getting hotter again, so it looks like we're getting here, now the question is, is this a natural thing, or do we contribute to this, and there are different people who have different opinions about this, I do believe in, in uh, global climate change to CO2, others don't, <coughs> but on the other hand, I think it would be a good idea to do something about it now, and then we invent all kinds of new technologies, we save energy, we move our planet forward, and in 50 years, if the naysayers were right, we say, okay, we, we, we developed our world forward. If we don't do no, nothing, we do the same old thing, use our coal and fire it up and pollute the air, then uh, we have not learned anything, we have not done anything. So even if I would be wrong, and we will, you probably will be able to tell this in 40 years, no problem, okay, you'll be a young man still.